Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom with today's show and speaker. Welcome to the Armor of Faith, a show where we hope to bring our listeners closer to the Word of God and the blessings we receive through living in the fullness of the Catholic faith. My name is Doug, and I'll be your host as we discuss the blessings of the Church Christ built upon Peter. I'm joined today by my lovely wife, Sharon, and also by Helen Hawkins, who is a member of Religious Formation at St. Philip the Nazi Catholic Mission here in Cedar Edge, Colorado. And she is also part of the um, group of uh, those studying to become lay Dominicans, also known as the Order of Preachers. So welcome to our panelists, as well as to our listeners. Let us open with prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we lift up our hearts in thanks and praise for this opportunity to open and share your holy word this day. We pray that you are with us and all our listeners as we share with one another the blessings of faith. We pray you will grant us wisdom and understanding as we seek to learn your holy truth. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. So during our first five episodes, we began a discussion as to the six components of the armor of God. And as a reminder, St. Paul listed these components in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18. In summary, they are the belt of truth, the breastplate, breastplate, easy for me to say, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Last week we discussed the helmet of salvation, and today we're going to discuss the sixth component of the armor of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. St. Jerome once said, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. So if we are to experience the fullness of faith, then we must study his word and endeavor to comprehend the depth of blessings we receive through the ultimate wisdom of God. The study of his word is not an easy task, for it requires time, diligence, and help. And what I mean by that is that if we do not open our day to spend time with his word, we leave its wisdom locked within the words we do not read, or upon which we do not take the time to contemplate and reflect. If we're not diligent in our efforts, we will not be able to uncover the depths of its meaning. And if we do not have help, then we limit ourselves in our comprehension. If we only turn to one another without the help of God, then how will we discern bias, deception, or misinterpretation from the truth that God seeks to reveal to us? So keeping this in mind, let's begin our discussion with the following question. What is the word of God, and what is its meaning to us? Well, for me, thinking about that, um, I, I think that it was kind of a small coincidental miracle that a book <laughs> written by Pope Benedict called In the Beginning, A Catholic Understanding of Creation and the Fall fell into my lap a few days ago. I would like to quote Pope Benedict's response to the beginning lines of Genesis. These words, which the Holy Spirit begins, always have an effect on me of the solemn tolling of a great bell, which stirs the heart from afar with its beauty and dignity and gives it an inkling of the mystery of eternity. This book was written to answer and explain Catholic understanding of the truth of the Bible and how the Church answers those who would discount this truth and set aside the Bible as ancient myths that have no bearing in the world today. The book has given me a lot to think about, and it will take me some time to really grasp Pope Benedict's logic and message. But it did set my mind to thinking about the different ways people talk and think about the Bible. I'm thinking of lay people, such as myself, who are not well-versed in logic, history, theology, and the study that scholars spend a lifetime teaching, thinking, and talking about. Now, what I'm going to say is not Pope Benedict's thinking. It's the track my mind took. With Pope 
Benedict's words, the solemn tolling of a great old bell, my thoughts almost immediately turned to the opening sounds of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And it has given me a beginning of an answer when someone challenges me about my belief and the love for the Bible. I ask them, is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony true or false? Music scholars dissect the music of great composers. They pick these works of art, looking for modes, key changes, patterns, and hundreds more tiny details. And this is good that scholars do, for it keeps them happy and busy, and for the most part, the nitty-gritty of the details of these works of art do not cloud their minds for the sound of God speaking through men which is what is meant when we say that a work of art is inspired. The world needs both literal-minded and mystics. The problem often arises when a literal-minded scientist runs up against a literal-minded lover of the Bible. It has recently occurred to me that it is the literal-minded lover of the Bible who keeps the stories in the Bible from becoming mushy stories for children and from becoming a foggy haze in the mind of spiritual marijuana. It is the literal-minded scholar and scientist who places the Bible in time and space. And it is the Catholic Church that is able to sort all this out and teach the truth of the Bible. But while all these theories swirl about, I can sit back and listen to God's truth when I read. God created heaven and the earth, and he saw that this was good. And this is why I know that the, Bible, the words God is true, and I, this is why I know I can use it in my day-to-day -day life as an armor of God. Absolutely. One thing that I noticed that you mentioned in there was um, the different perspectives we have based upon our education of the word. So, for example, if we are to simply take the Bible by ourselves in isolation and, and read it, would we fully comprehend it? And we also might uh, approach it from the standpoint of... Um, intimidation, if you will, if we're trying to com comprehend it in the same way that a theologian would. But we also have to remember that there was a day that that theologian had the sa exact same under um, perception as we did because they didn't become a theologian overnight. It took considerable time and study for them to get there. The other challenge that, that we have, and this kind of maybe goes into um, the refutation of Sola Scriptura, is there are those that say only what's in the Bible matters. If it's not in the Bible, it doesn't matter. But the thing is, is we have to reach out to a number of things to understand the context of the Bible. We have to understand the history uh, of the times that it recounts, the surrounding history, um, to be able to give the fullness of context as to what people were experiencing and what was influencing their thought and their mindset. We also have to look at their culture because our norms, our values, how we lead our daily lives are all influenced by our culture. And then we also have to look at what is the Bible telling us in terms of linguistics. We have to remember that even if we read the original Greek or Hebrew, um, that in reality it's still a translation from what was spoken at the time. And, for example, the Aramaic that Jesus spoke um, as we experience the New Testament. So that itself is, is a translation. And then the influences over time, uh, and, I've, and we, we've mentioned earlier about idioms and the one that Sharon likes to use about, you know, the, the reigning dogs and cats. So we have to take all these things to put together and say, does it change my perception if I understand the history, if I understand the culture, if I understand the language? And sometimes we have to worry, is our translation true? Sometimes we're dependent upon, I mean, we can't, I don't know about you, but my Aramaic is just really not 
No, I'm good. <laughs> um, so, so from that standpoint, or even my Greek or my Hebrew, you know, I, I, I'm not a scholar in any of those parts. So I am dependent upon people before me who have translated the scriptures into a matter that I can truly understand it. So you, you bring up an important point in terms of our dilemma, uh, if you will, and the fact that there are a number of translations out there that and sometimes it's not in the scripture that they translate, but maybe within the footnotes explaining their translation that heresies are, are introduced. And so that, that sheds light on the importance of the magisterium of the, of the church to help guide us in our understanding of what scripture is telling us. And the one thing that we always want to guard against is becoming wise in our own eyes. Um, you know, we can, we can fall to that temptation because you know, we, we talk and we mention, and as, as I opened with, we need to spend time with Scripture if we are going to unlock its mysteries, if we're going to understand what this great letter of God means to us. I mean, that's, that's extremely important. And so there is, there's this dilemma that, uh, that may cause us to say, well, why waste my time on it if I'm not going to understand it? Why waste my time if there's names I cannot pronounce? Why waste my time if, if the writing is such that I get lost in its artistry? <laughs> um, and, and there's any number of ways that we can get lost. But the one thing that I offer, always offer to people um, when they, they deal with that dilemma of Scripture is the importance of the Holy Spirit in our understanding. And so from that standpoint, Jesus told us that he would give us an advocate, one who would remind us of all that he taught, and one who would guide us in truth, and that's the Holy Spirit. So if we ask the Holy Spirit to lead us in understanding uh, as we prepare to open Scripture and read it, I believe that prayer will surely be answered. We may not understand in the moment, and I've experienced this in a number of occasions where I have read pieces of Scripture over and over and over again, and I did not fully comprehend their meaning in that moment. But there was a time that God unlocked that mystery for me. And all of a sudden I sit back and go, oh, wow. And a lot of times I find that that mystery is unlocked because of someone he has sent in my path that draws my attention to something in a slightly different way, that suddenly suddenly the, the meaning is unlocked for me. You know, I think I, I've always felt that whenever you go to do something, the first time you do it is always hard. Now think back to when you were first learning to read. Boy, standing out those alphabets was tough. And then when you had to put those letters together to make words, that was hard. Um, you know, it, whatever you do, you know, it's learning to play the piano. You know, you have to start off with one note at a time. And I, that's the same way. And I think that's what keeps people from reading scripture is it becomes a daunting task in the very beginning because there's so much in there. And, you know, and if you're reading a version that has the these, the thous, and that makes it even more confusing because that's not language that we are adjusted to in our lives today. So we have to keep going and, and, and keep persevering because the first time is hard. The second time gets a little bit easier and the next time gets a little bit easier and pretty soon you're able to read it and understand it. And then, when you, and then if you do Bible studies, you start understanding the threads that connect the Old and the New Testament and it makes it so much easier. But it's not easy in the beginning, and I think that's what keeps people from um, pursuing the knowledge of Scripture. It's because it, they just feel like it's too hard. Mm -hmm. it, it can be intimidating. I mean, uh, I know a lot of, well, I was one of these folks. Uh, I decided one day I was going to read it from cover to cover. And I've made a couple of attempts at that. Um, Oddly enough, the, the, the closest I've come was to get to the last two pages of Revelation. 
oh my gosh, you think, well, why didn't I finish it? <laughs> yeah, um, I've, I've read uh, Genesis and Exodus many times uh -huh. in my effort. And you get to the Leviticus and go, so there it is. <laughs> and, and I often wonder, how do theologians do it? Yeah. I, I really do. But the thing is, is they, they did it by starting. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing for us, is that if we are, are really to truly get the benefit of it, we just have to spend some time with it. And, you know, that's, that's one of the blessings we have as, as Catholics, is that our Mass is also centered around the Bible. I mean, if we look at during the course of Mass, we reflect upon or celebrate over 100 elements of Scripture. Now, it's not always the same 100 elements. I mean, some of them are because there's certain elements of the Mass that we do the same. But it also changes over the liturgical year. It changes over time. We have different Scriptures that are read. And so we're exposed um, to, to this continuation of Scripture. And then we also have the benefit of the homily. One of the, one of the, there's, there's two dilemmas that I, that I think we have in dealing with God's Word. The first one, and this is what I always fear, is do I misinterpret it? And so that misinterpretation is, this is that I read something in it that's not really there, God didn't really intend, and we may ask the question of, well, why did I read that in there? Is it because I just want to, I want to find power to put behind my personal agenda, and so there I look, therefore I look for God's words to put forth my personal agenda. But the one that I think is even worse is when we ignore his word. And, and so we do have to look to, uh, to those that will help us understand it in his meaning. But we also have to be careful that when we do understand its meaning, that we don't turn our back up on it. One of the things I would like to draw attention to is Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 8 through 12, and I'll read it here. Ezra read clearly from the book of the law of God, interpreting it so that all could understand what was read. Then Nehemiah, that is the governor, and Ezra, the priest, scribe, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to all the people, Today is holy to the Lord your God. Do not lament. Do not weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. He continued, Go, eat rich foods, and drink sweet drinks, and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared. For today is holy to our Lord. Do not be saddened this day, for rejoicing in the Lord is your strength. And the Levites quieted all the people, saying, Silence. Today is holy. Do not be saddened. Then all the people began to eat and drink, to distribute portions, and to celebrate with great joy, for they understood the words that had been explained to them. So Ezra is a priest scribe in the line of genealogy which traces back to Aaron, the brother of Moses. Now as a priest in the line of those anointed by God, Ezra is responsible for sharing the word of God so that all who hear may understand. And so that's what we see in the opening of the scripture. Ezra interpreted it so that all could understand what was read. So part of the role of a priest is as teacher of the flock in matters relating to God. In what ways do our priests seek to teach us the holy word of God? In our homilies. In our, yeah, in our homilies. And also their way of life. Um, the, so many of the priests, the priests that I have met, they've given everything up to help us. And oftentimes, I, I've noticed that people, have, Catholics, have not really appreciated the sacrifices that they give. And uh, they do it with their homies, they do it with their way of life, and, and most, well, I won't say the most important, with the sacraments that they give us, such as the sacrament of reconciliation, which probably is the most difficult one of all for all of us to deal with, and the sacrament of the anointing when we are sick, and other sacraments which can bring so much comfort to people. And, and 
that becomes very important, I think, and, and overlooked, not only not understood by many people who are not Catholics, and also not understood in its importance to Catholics. Uh, I think that many times we just take these things for granted without realizing what the priest is doing for us and what he has given up. Yeah, and and part of the question is, is do we listen to the court during the course of the homily? Or do our minds kind of wander with whatever the, the problem of the coming week is or the day or or this or what have you? And, and this is a struggle. I mean, we all we all do this. Our minds wander. I mean, I... I I do it all the time, and, and sadly, I find myself at time when finally some words of Father catch me. I go, oh, oh, wait a second, what did he just say? Um, I didn't <laughs> catch all of that. Oh, oh my gosh, I, I, can't, I can't turn back the DVR. Oh, my gosh. So we do have to be present in the moment when we go to the Mass, and I know this is sometimes a tough task. I mean, it's just, it's, it's our nature to, for because our minds work so quickly compared to our hearing that they can kind of say that, oh, okay, yeah, father's off talking, da 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 and we, we just wander off. And, and to realize how much work a priest will put into these sermons. And, yeah, I, I'm really bad about that. I, I've noticed how different people handle it. There's one, one woman in our church that I will see her taking notes, and she said, well, it helps me keep focused on what he's saying. I find my mind drifting off, and and I and I found a little prayer that I that if, I, if I'm not able to concentrate, I'll say that the prayer between his the pauses, so that forces me to listen to the words as he's talking to me. I it, but it isn't easy, and it's not fair to the priest. Yeah. And then one of the questions that I, I would ask here is, can we learn everything we need to learn strictly from the Mass? Um, no. <laughs> I mean, you have to study to even understand what's going on during the Mass. That's, and I, and I think a lot of people don't fully comprehend all that we experience during the course of the Mass. I mean, we do have our ritual, and, and <clears throat> as we go in and daily, it's easy to take things for granted. From the moment that Father says, good morning, brothers and sisters, and the greetings that we share, and the prayers that we share, and the responses that we share, a lot of times, if, if we don't have some outside study and instruction and education, I mean, how are we to know what we have available to us during the course of the Mass. We all may recognize the importance of the miracle that's performed during the course of the Mass, but I remember one time where I was trying to make a point about how we don't experience miracles on a regular basis, and I had a young child point out to me, but, but every time at Mass there's a miracle. <laughs> kind of going, well, uh, yeah, you're right. I didn't think about that. And, and so what it reveals is, is the fact that God gives us a number of ways to learn. The question is, do we take advantage of all of them? And if we are to experience the fullness of our faith, then we have to look at our day and say, what are we taking advantage of? How are we exposing ourselves to all the things that God is seeking to teach us? And he's reached out with his angels and his prophets. He's reached out with his only begotten son. Um, and by extension, we also have the blessings of the church that Christ built upon Peter and the apostles that he sent to make disciples of all nations and to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. To educate all nations is a daunting task, and therefore, we, we, again, we have to look at the blessings we have that God created a church so that through the teaching responsibilities of the church, we have the opportunity to experience the fullness of faith. But it does require that we take on our part of the responsibility to reach out in terms of our learning. And that goes to the other part of do we ignore? 
Let me go to some scripture here uh, also in Isaiah. And it starts off, and this is, um, this is Isaiah 5, uh, verses 20 to 24. It starts off, Ah, those who call evil good, and good evil. Fortunately, we don't experience that in our day. Right. Um, <laughs> who, who change darkness to light, and light into darkness. Who change bitter to sweet, and sweet into bitter. Ah, those who are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own view. Ah, those who are champions at drinking wine, masters at mixing drink. Those who acquit the guilty for bribes and deprive the innocent of justice. Almost like this was maybe written for our day. If you yeah. kind of just look at the at the um, <clears throat> uh, the newspapers and the news stories. It's like what I what I was saying about uh, the word in the in the Bible and the word of God is not something that should be assigned to the past as if it was some sort of myth. Because the more you read the stories about the people in the Bible, the more you realize that as things change, nothing changes at all. Yeah, the more you recognize our own day. Yeah. So it continues, Therefore, as the tongue of fire licks up stubble, as dry grass shrivels in the flame, their roots shall not, and their blossoms scatter like dust. For they have rejected the instruction of the Lord of hosts and scorned the word of the Holy One of Israel. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 1, it reads, Ah, rebellious children, oracle of the Lord, who carry out a plan that is not mine, who make an alliance I did not inspire, thus adding sin upon sin. And what is being referred to is that the people were getting ready to make an alliance with Egypt. And so we continue to see later on in uh, verses 8 through 15 of chapter 30. Now come, write it on a tablet. They can keep and scribe it on a scroll, that in time to come it may be an eternal witness. In other words, God already knows what they're going to do. For this is a rebellious people, deceitful children, children who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see to the prophets. Do not prophesy truth for us. Speak smooth things to us. See visions that deceive. Turn aside from the way. Get out of the path. Let us hear no more of the Holy One of Israel. Therefore, says the the Holy One of Israel, because you reject this word and put your trust in oppression and deceit and depend upon them, this iniquity of yours shall be like a descending rift, bulging out in a high wall whose crash comes suddenly in an instant, crashing like a potter's jar, smashed beyond rescue, and among its fragments cannot be found, a share to scoop fire from the herd or dip water from the cistern. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, by waiting and by calm you shall be saved, in quiet and in trust shall be your strength, but this you did not will. So the scripture of Isaiah 30 reveals the displeasure of God and that people trusted in an alliance of the world rather than the hand and word of God. It concludes with this, but this you did not will. It also reflects the delusion of the people as they seek prophecy to their liking rather than the truth. So this brings up the question, can and bringing it into our day, can we reflect upon any modern-day similarities where we prefer words of deceit and placation over words of truth? Oh, there are so many. Where do you even begin? <laughs> <laughs> and so little time because we, we have less than an hour now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think one, there's several. You can have it all. That, that is one. No, you can't have it all. Um, and, uh, you know, I used to say when when I was a young mother and I was getting together in play groups with with um, other young mothers and their children and and I and people would be lamenting, well, you know, I should be getting a job and I could be doing this and you know I could be doing that and I used to say, you know, we can have anything and everything we want, we just can't have it all at the same time. And this is your time to be a parent. 
Because, you know, someday if you go out and you spend all your time ignoring your children, there's going to come a time when you're going to regret that. So enjoy the time you have now. And when you have to go out and go to work, you won't regret that you didn't take, have that time with your children. And that, and that becomes a, 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 a sticky problem for a lot of people. You know, if, I know that I've worked off and on most, most of my life and with the children. And I kind of, in my mind, formulated a concept. And it's kind of weird. Like, there are three things. There's your social life, your family, and work. I mean, you can have two out of three. You can work and raise children, but you're not going to have your own private social life. One of those three, you're going to have to drop. You're going to have to drop. And, you can, and it's easily done because when my kids were little, my social life was my children and the events that they went to. There's a great deal of social, work, uh, social life and, and games and stuff. But if you think that you can work, have children, and go spend evenings out partying, you cannot have it all. You have to decide. And the thing is, is what a lot of people don't realize is the importance of enjoying their time. Mm -hmm. We may think at that time when the kids are small, <clears throat> and particularly if you have a wailing child it's in piercing your ears, you may think, well, this, this is not so much fun. And yet the day will come we are going to look wistfully back at those days and say, I wish I would have had more. Those days are now gone. But we also have to, you know, we, we also have to look for for every season there is a time. And and God has given us many ways by which we can listen to what he calls us to. And the one way we can look at it is, he's called me to this moment, I should enjoy it to its fullest. Because there will be a time that will come where it shall be no more. I mean, Think about that. We go through different stages of our lives. I remember my dad telling me, enjoy your time in high school. And I'm sitting there going, but I've got to prepare to, to go to college. He kept trying to tell me, enjoy your time in high school. Sometimes we look too much to, to the future and don't look at the moment. And, and, I, and suddenly after I eventually left college, because I should have remembered the same thing, enjoy your time in college, that's only four years. Well, for some people, it kind of lingers on. But it basically, it, it's only for this short period of time that we have this experience, and then we're going to move on. And then we're going to have another period of time for our experience, and then we're going to move on. And then we're eventually going to reach a point in time where our body starts wearing out in relation to the, some of the things that we enjoy doing. But that's okay because we're moving on. The real question is, this is that do we recognize the different phases of our life that God gives us? And do we recognize the opportunities of joy that he gives us? And do we take the fullest advantage of that time? Sometimes if we leave ourselves wandering, going, well, what should I do with my life now? What do I want to grow up to be? I'm still working on that. But... Um, and someday I might figure it out about exactly what I'm going to be when I grow up. But we still should be asking the question, at this time in our life, what is God calling us to? And do we look at it as a burden, or do we look at it as an opportunity to enjoy the fullness of our faith? And if a lot of people understood the opportunities we have to live the fullness of our faith, we would say, well, why am I wasting time with these worldly endeavors when I can have what God offers. It, it is kind of fun look, thinking about that and looking back. I, I was very fortunate. Although I kind of worked off and on with when my kids, it, it was part-time work. But so I basically was home with them. And then when they left, I worked 30 years for a water company, or 25, hard to say. Um, and I, when I started, when I started working, there were people of my age, women of my age, who were already tired of work. And I was just beginning. And now I have retired and I've got all of this ahead of me. And, but I, but I, when you said, you know, who am I and searching for oneself, I laughingly 
to tell my first grandson when he's down and out that I didn't know who I was until you were born, and then I was a grandma, and everything just fell in place. <laughs> and I, I just see that working is important. It's important for women, to, especially women who have a great deal to offer in, in um, oh, as doctors and teachers and stuff. Mm -hmm. But so often I see women working in drudgery work that they, they're hardly making enough money to, to pay for their work that they're doing. And I, I anyway, that's not what we're going to be discussing. <laughs> so let's move on from that. Well, one of the things that we can look at that's kind of along those lines is, is that we do spend our lives uh, where we're trying to gather in things. We, we, we are tempted to define our success by the way the world defines our success. But in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 to 38, it says, What profit is there for one to gain the whole world and forfeit his life? What could one give in exchange for his life? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, in this faithfulness and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. As I mentioned, our endeavors are often focused upon this world. And indeed, we need to work for our daily survival if we're to be healthy for the work to which he calls us. But too often our endeavors are for what will pass to dust in this world as opposed to what will follow us into the next. That brings up the question, in what ways do we set the priorities of our life and what is the meaning of his word to our choices? Okay. I think we have to look at our, our day, what, what is going on in our life at this moment. Um, now, we, right now, we, Doug and I are in a position of being able to, to work with the church and teach classes and be a part of that. We weren't able to do that years ago when Doug was running around with his career and, and uh, I was busy raising children. But we did participate because we participate, we, we did participate at church and we taught our children about God. We taught the respect of God. We took our children to church. We read all the Bible stories we could. And so we, were, we had to do what we could at that moment. We can't be expected to be scripture scholars from the beginning, like you started off, Doug, when you started off the, the talk today with scripture scholars were once where we're at today, and they, they had to learn. And so, you know, we just have to, we have to not put ourselves down because we're not as smart as someone else. We have to look at the moment and where we're at. And if it means that we, we participate in, in different Bible studies for, so someone else can teach us, that's what we have to do. And before long, we're going to be able to pick up that Bible and read and understand it on our own. But I think God has called us, called us no matter what our calling in life is, he wants us to give everything for him. He gave us everything. He gave us life. He gave us parents. He gave us children. He gave us friends. He gave us everything we have. And he gave each of us different gifts, which we have the opportunity to use for his purpose. Right. Right. We, one of the things that you know, we, we have many cues in, ter in terms of how we make decisions about what we are going to do or what we're not going to do. And, and of course, we, we have this desire for social acceptance. We have this, uh, this desire to be comfortable. Um, so we have the cues of the world about whether we are socially accepted or <clears throat> we also know whether or not we're, we're comfortable. I mean, avoiding pain and all that good kind of stuff, avoiding hunger, avoiding thirst, being sufficiently warm, not too warm, not too cold, but finding a chair that's just right, all those types of things. But it's his word that 
also helps us in our choices, not from the standpoint of are we only making ourselves comfortable, but the lives that we're leading with those who surround us. And if we're just selfish, then it can really turn out to be a fairly miserable life. Um, if we are partially giving, then we may partially follow the path of God, but because we're partially selfish, then, well, perhaps are we denying ourselves the fullness of our faith? You know, these are, these are questions that we have to ask of ourselves. If we only take one snippet of scripture, we may not understand the fullness of context. Um, so therefore, that's why it takes time for us to continue to study it and for it to continually, for us to allow it to continue to mold it. Because the more time we spend with it, we will discern its wisdom, we'll discern its meaning in, in terms of our relationships of how we deal with one another, how we approach one another when we're dealing with conflict, or, or how we approach one another when we're dealing with somebody that is, that is in need, or even how we decide to, to divide up those things that we earn, you know, whether we use them for our purpose or whether we, uh, we share them in charity for the blessings of others. His word gives us guidance in terms of how we can make our choices uh, in the blessings of our day. But, you know, kind of going back to that question that we also mentioned earlier is, is that um, how, do we, how are we to understand all of it? And can we ever hope to approach what the theologian has done? Um, and, and so I, I think one example to help address that question is in uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 27 to 31. And it says, Indeed they gathered in this city against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, Herod and Pontius Pilate, together with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do what your hand and your will have long ago planned to take place. And now, Lord, take note of their threats. Enable your servants to speak your word with all boldness. As you stretch forth your hand to heal and signs and wonders are done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. As they prayed, the place where they were gathered shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So it was through the Holy Spirit the disciples of Jesus were emboldened to speak the word of God. In what ways does his word embolden us, and in what ways does the Holy Spirit guide us? For me, well, that's a hard question to try to answer. Of the Holy Spirit, I think, can allow us to see beyond ourselves and to hope and plan beyond ourselves. And when we can do that, we're not afraid. We're not afraid to speak because we know we know that there is something more to, to understand and to be gained than just the present feeling of being uncomfortable. But that doesn't always help when you're faced with a situation and you feel like you're going to be ridiculed or for a lot of people just dismissed as being dumb or stupid or something that just dismissed. I think sometimes it's easier to have somebody attack you for your thoughts than to just dismiss you as if what you said had no bearing at all. And I think we all find ourselves doing that. I know I find myself doing that sometime with people. I will just dismiss what they're saying because I don't want to engage. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think one of the things that I, I know this is one of my main concerns is, is that um, it can be intimidating from the standpoint that while I want to be able to use the scripture and the wisdom which is contained within it, 
I, I'm scared at times about unintentionally introducing heresies. And so who might want to silence me with that intimidation? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would silence? No, it'll silence you from saying something heretical. Who would, yeah. The Holy Spirit would help me not to say something heretical, oh. but the one who would silence me in sharing oh, scripture, yeah, maybe I didn't, ask the question, say, yeah. <laughs> I didn't ask the question very well, but the one who would silence me or who would try to intimidate me most from sharing in scripture, I believe is the evil one. I think we have to be concerned that we do search out truth, and so therefore we have to look to the role that the, the church plays for us as the magisterium um, in helping us to understand. And if we do discover that we, we have shared a heresy, well, then we should take ownership of that and say, okay, well, I won't do that again. Um, right. But also, if I happen to remember who I shared it with, maybe I should go back and correct it and, and take, the, take the fullness of the meaning to them. Yeah. Also, in, in, in the desire to share the Bible, which, you know, I just love, um, we have to be careful to understand where people are coming from, too. I have noticed in my life and, and in different people who have become Catholics, they were not argued into it. And they were not, because when you get into a debate, oftentimes it's just two people that truly just enjoy debating. I don't think people are generally converted into Catholicism or any religion with debate unless that person is wanting mm -hmm. to hear what you have to say. Uh, a mutual friend of ours gradually became a, a Catholic because she found herself at the uh, Vatican and she did not realize or did not know of the art that was available. And she just was so wild about everything that she had ever thought about Christianity she was an atheist. Everything that she thought about, everything, she saw it in a different light. And it, over a period of time, that love of that beauty was what brought her to Catholicism. And it's, it's the love that's going to do it. And then the questioning and whatnot. We need to be prepared to give the honest answers about what's going on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think you bring up a very strong point there when you talk about the fact that sometimes when people engage in debate, they feel the obligation to dig in their heels in terms of their, their position. And, and um, in actuality, we may have better opportunities by simply living our faith so that people can observe it. Or if we are engaged in conversation, that we seek to engage in conversation uh, and to learn about the other person um, and what questions they might have in faith um, in, in terms of being able to um, better understand um, in, in, in terms of being able to better understand um, what we can offer through the, the faith. And, and so it, it is better not to engage, as you say, to, so much as to engage in debate as it is to be able to um, be armed with truth, be armed with, with, uh, with word and fact, but be able to present it in a way just as we are called to in, in 1 Peter 3.15 to be prepared to give reason for our hope, but also to share it with civility, with kindness, with reverence, because then we have a better op better opportunity that we bring down the shields of debate and and be able to to raise the opportunity of joining together in conversation. We were talking here um, about the importance of the magisterium of the church, and I'd like to to pull out a couple of things from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, um, and one of these is in uh, section. 1,100, 
that is titled The Word of God. And it says, The Holy Spirit first recalled the meaning of the salvation event to the liturgical assembly by giving life to the Word of God, which is proclaimed so that it may be received and lived. In the celebration of the liturgy, sacred scripture is extremely important. From it come the lessons that are read and explained in the homily and the psalms that are sung. It is from the scriptures that the prayers, collects, and hymns draw their inspiration and their force, and their actions and signs derive their meaning. In section 1088, it says, to accomplish so great a work, the dispensation or communication of his work of salvation, Christ is always present in his church, especially in her liturgical celebrations. He is present in the sacrifice of the Mass, not only in the person of his minister, the same now offering through the ministry of priests who formerly offered himself on the cross, but especially in the Eucharistic species. By his power, he is present in the sacraments so that when anybody baptizes, it is really Christ himself who baptizes. He is present in his word since it is he himself who speaks when the Holy Scriptures are read in the church. And lastly, he is present when the church prays and sings, for he has promised where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. In section 1358, it says, We must therefore consider the Eucharist as thanksgiving and praise to the Father, the sacrificial memorial of Christ and his body, the presence of Christ by the power of his word and of his spirit. So during the course of the Mass, as I mentioned, we reflect upon or celebrate over 100 elements of Scripture. And as we attend Mass, we have the opportunity to both learn and celebrate. And attending Mass is central to our exercise of faith and our learning of his word. In, in, what, other ways may we expose, can, in what other ways can we expose ourselves to his word such that we may prepare ourselves to carry and wield the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I have started trying to memorize things. Uh, simple prayers and whatnot. I don't have a good memory. <laughs> um, but it seems to me when when I work with memory, memorization, um, I hear and see a lot more in a simple scripture or piece of Psalms, primarily, that that I was not aware of. Not I was not aware of structure. I was not aware of how the words flowed into each other. I become more appreciative of the early, before reading, before writing. These so many of these ancient stories, uh, they are dismissed because they were done by memory and by words. What we don't understand is that these men who studied, and women, who studied these things, did not deviate. They memorized, and they learned it. And they probably knew it far better than any one of us who read it could even hope to. And sometimes we do have to be prepared to paraphrase it, um, because it's, their memory's like mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to do this at home. <laughs> but, you, but, but using different tools is important. So memorizing certain verses um, is important, certain verses that speak to you, certain things that, that touch you during the course of your life. And that, that's why spending time in, in reading and reflection. Um, I'm amazed at the number of times I've sat down and I've started, started reading something either directly from the Bible or within the Missal um, or even in, in um, <clears throat> uh, other, other aids that we have in terms of prayers and like that. And suddenly, in those words, I'm reflecting upon what is happening in my day. I may be even reflecting on a, on a uh, particular dilemma that I've had or a decision that I'm trying to make. And suddenly there, I look down and I see something that is guiding me in those words. But along those same lines, going back to always being prepared to give a reason for our hope, there's some elements of Scripture that speak to some of us 
louder than others. And that's part of being able to explain what, what does faith mean to me? What does God mean to me? What does, what does his son mean to me? And what does the Holy Spirit mean to me? I have to spend time in all, in all those areas, but I also have to spend time with his word. And, but as you mentioned, the more time that you spend, you end up finding that, that maybe not even intentionally, but you find that something speaks to you so loudly that you do memorize it and you're able to quote it word for word. Um, and there are some of those things that, that I find very valuable when I do engage others in, in conversation. The more, the more you spend with it, the, sec, the more second nature it, it becomes to us. So I have some, some final thoughts here as we're closing in on our few, last few minutes. And it goes to the time when Jesus was tempted in, this, in the desert by Satan. And I'd like you to consider the following scripture. And this comes from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. It says that, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. The tempter approached and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. Jesus said in reply, It is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and with your hands they will support you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test, then the devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their magnificence. And he said to him, All these I shall give to you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. At this Jesus said to him, Get away, Satan. It is written, The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. So perhaps we see in the scripture how the word of God is like a sword. A sword may be used to defend or attack. It may be used to deflect blows from an, impotent, an opponent as well as to strike. Satan attempted to strike by twisting scripture to achieve the purposes of his temptations, but Jesus, the word made flesh, both defended and struck with truth until Satan left him. Of course, we expect the word made flesh to be able to speak in truth, but what about our use of scripture? Can we hope to have the same knowledge as Jesus? Are we able to wield the sword of the Spirit with the skill and strength of Jesus? If we're honest, we face many challenges in our ability to absorb and comprehend the vast meaning of his word. Our hope does not come from becoming wise in our own eyes, but in the wisdom God seeks to plant within our hearts. As Satan swirls about us to confuse us and deceive us to his ends, we should remember we are not in the fight alone. Jesus said at the Last Supper, if you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always, the Spirit of truth, which the world cannot accept because it neither sees nor knows it, but you know it, because it remains with you, and it will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Jesus continued, Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. Now, of course, Satan was going to try to deceive and confuse us, just as he was able to deceive the first couple of the garden. And if we do not know his holy word, we leave ourselves vulnerable to the one who seduces us to evil and seeks to separate us from our creator. We face many challenges in our understanding and comprehension, but Jesus has not left us alone. He told us that the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, that the Father will send in his name will teach us everything and remind us of all that he told us. He said, Peace I leave with you, and my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give it to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled or afraid. So let us then ask in prayer for the Holy Spirit to guide us in truth, wisdom, and understanding of the Holy Word of God, so that we may not only defend our faith, but drive evil away from us, so we may live in peace, and so we may receive the salvation which is ours through the sacrifice 
of the only begotten Son of God. So once again, our time has come to an end. So uh, we hope you uh, will be able to join us again next week as we pick up our discussion with the armor of God in our lives. And let us conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to open and discuss your holy word. We pray that as we go our separate ways, you will continue to walk with us and help us to see how we may share the blessings of truth, righteousness, peace, faith, salvation, and your holy word of the gospel, not only for the benefit of our lives, but also the lives of all who cross our path. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thank you. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.